The next thing on our agenda is our keynote speaker. And uh, Mr. Wayne Dahlback, uh, he's Senior Technology Manager for Mido Inco Incorporated, okay, um, and is the 2012 Chairman of the Process uh, Industries Practices. Okay. And his uh, topic uh, tonight is Best Practices for Piping Design, which is right down our alley. Anytime I get in front of a group of pipers, I know the first thing I got to do is to get my street cred up on the screen. So I pulled out some of the stuff that's in uh, my resume and some of the stuff I no longer put in my resume uh, up here to give you a little feeling for the background. Now, there's two jobs on that list that were my favorite jobs. One was chief engineer of piping and plant design for Technip, and the other was the same thing for Shaw. And the reason was they were my favorite jobs on this list, two reasons. One. As a hiring manager, I got a chance to put the best people in the group around me working directly for me and hiring the best people. So that was one real pleasure to that job. But the second pleasure was, after a lot of years in piping and doing a lot of that kind of work, I had my own favorite pra practices that I thought were the most important practices. And so in this role, I got to implement those at the company. And I'm going to show you some of those tonight. I got to implement those at the, at the companies I was at. Quick blurb on Mado. Mado's kind of new to Houston. We've only had an office down here for about a year and a half. Uh, they're not new to Cleveland, Chicago. They do a lot of refinery work up around the Midwest. And uh, uh, you can see here we're up to 800 professionals now, ranked 98 in the type, top 500. Uh, our office was right over here by Papacitos, right on I-10. And we've been growing fairly strongly. We've got both an offshore uh, and an onshore division that we're working. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the topic tonight. And uh, the topic, uh, the, the things I'm going to try to cover here with you is, one is piping uh, uh, practices within process industry practices. And process industry practices naturally is a favorite of mine because this year I'm the chairman. Each year the chairman rotates. And so I think Pip's got a good story to tell on this subject. So I'm going to spend a little time talking about that. And next, uh, I want to talk about just some things on your company's functional methods. I think that's a good place to get uh, learning from, and there's a way to do that through your own company's uh, functional methods. I've got some of my favorite books I'm going to throw up. I'm going to talk about the technical network, really LinkedIn kind of things. And then I'll, I'll can't get off the subject without talking about SPED. So I'll tell you what, let me grab a couple notes. Okay, process industry practices. What it is is, it is a group of companies that have been together 20 years. This is our 20th year. The 17 original companies got together, mostly owner operators with a few engineering contractors, and they decided to do something radical. And that radical thing was, was to come up with a group of standards and procedures and guides that they would all use. Now you can see why that might be radical when the owner operators and the engineering contractors compete against each other. And part of their competition is who's technically strongest. So the idea that you're going to get together and actually decide on which practices to use was a radical concept 20 years ago. Now it's grown to something quite large. I'll go over some of the uh, 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 details of that in a minute. It's under the auspices of CII, and I don't know how many of you in here know Construction Industry Institute. Sound familiar? They're a big research outfit. They work under the University of Texas. 
They're under the U UT's auspices. All the intellectual property that comes out of the Construction Industry Institute is owned by UT. PIP is part of that overall umbrella, although we act uh, separately. We're over that overall umbra umbrella. All our practices are actually owned by the University of Texas, uh, uh, but we develop them with the member companies. These member companies that join put in participants, and we write and revise our practices. We've been doing that for 20 years. Right now, we've got uh, more than 60 uh, member companies. And by member companies, I mean companies that actually participate in the writing and revising of practices. And we've got, uh, out of those, <clears throat> maybe 40% uh, are engineering contractors, 60% are owner-operators. Right now, we're operating in over 40 different countries, and I'm going to show you a little bit of that here in a minute. Organization-wise, it's organized just like your projects are organized, PIP is. Right? We've got an overall executive committee. You can see the pictures of the guys there. The, the overall uh, 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 steering committee has one member from each member company on it. And then below that, you see these function teams here. They're broken up by disciplines. Each function team is responsible for writing the practices, and then they review the practice every five years and update it. Now, why would these companies want to get together and do something like this? Well, there's less risk in having a standard set of standards and practices and design guides that you use. There's less risk in the sense that it reduces uncertainty in the, in the particularly from the engineering contractor's uh, perspective, it reduces uncertainty in the uh, project design and the engineering basis. If you have your client come in and give you a whole set of standards that they want you to work to and you're not familiar with them, that's uncertainty, that's risk, and that means cost. When you have more risk on a job, there's more cost to it. Uh, also, the risk of forecasting schedules. When you're dealing with your own practices that you know very well, it's a lot easier to forecast when you're going to get done and how much it's going to cost. When you're dealing with a client's uh, practices that you don't know too well, it's easy to get trapped into a bad forecast, whether that's in schedule or in hours. Also, there's just less raw cost, not associated with risk. There's less raw cost in the sense that, that uh, when you're dealing with a different set of standards as an engineering contractor than what you're used to, it's inevitable that there's going to be deviations, that you're going to miss things. The client's going to pick on some, hey, paragraph such and such on page 300, you didn't do it. And so you got to track those deviations. So there's cost associated with that. There's cost associated with training and the other costs that you see up here. Now, those two pictures up there I wanted to point out. The, one, the top picture is a four volumes. It's probably 1,500 pages. Those are just the piping practices that were client-specific on that particular project. Those four volumes, all client-specific. Some of them look similar to PIP practices, of the companies I've seen. It was a mishmash of stuff, right? The picture down below is the staffing curve for this project. It ran around 30 months. The turquoise light blue bar on that stack bar are the pipers. And you can see how we start out kind of low, we come up to a bigger, and then we come down. But actually, the pipers, the way that's staffed, I was involved with staffing that job, was that many of the pipers that were on the front end of the job, front end layout, RDB, pipe spec guys, weren't necessarily the people at the back end of the job, your scrubbers, your checkers, those kind of things. And so the turnover of people, maybe in a lifetime was like 12 months, 18 months on the project. And each one of those people coming in had to know those four volumes, hundreds, if not thousands of pages of practices. Really unreasonable when you think about it. It's not surprising that engineers would miss things in their specs when they've got to know that much stuff in that little time. That's what makes PIP powerful. When your client comes in as an engineering contractor and they're using the exact same practices that you're using and you've been using for years, it makes things a lot easier. Here's some owner-operator member companies. This isn't all of them, but this is most of them. There's probably five or ten missing that we've added in the last year. And you can see these are, once again, member companies. So they have a participant on the function teams. They have a participant on the steering team. So they're, they're providing people that actually write and revise practices. And you see a lot of big names there. Engineering contractors. 
All these have belonged, many of these have belonged to Pip for 20 years. Also, you see a lot of big names that you see around town and around the world. These are subscribers on the left-hand side. Subscribers are people or companies that don't participate in the writing or revising of practices, but they do buy the practices. They pay a fee every year to do that. And you can see this list on the left are of subscribers from about a year ago. This is growing rapidly, by the way. Subscribers from a year ago uh, uh, that uh, purchase our practices, the whole set. Right? Now, the graphs, there's another way we put out PIP practices. We use IHS. We use TechStreet. We recently signed up SA, SAI Global. Anybody, y'all use IHS? Anybody familiar with IHS or TechStreet? A lot of your companies might have a little site that you go to. It says you need to look up the oh, ASME B31.3 code, right? Well, you know, do you go out and buy it? No, you go on to IHS because you get a subscription to it. You can bring up the code and take a look at it. IHS also sells practices. They sell PIP practices. We get a royalty on it, right? These charts show over the last six years where IHS has sold practices. The top chart, you can't read it too well, but the big bar is US, the next bigger bar is Canada, then France, China, and Taiwan. Not too surprising, 60% of the practices are sold to companies here in the US. What I found surprising was the bottom chart, and I know it's hard to read. But when you take out Canada, the US, and France, it's all those, company, all those countries that make up where we're sending where PIP practices are being purchased. Oman, Namibia, Nigeria. I mean, all over the world. You can see that list across there. It's a bunch of different countries that are buying PIPs and using them worldwide, even though they're not getting them directly from us. In fact, when we took a look at it, there's even some bookstores overseas that are buying our PIP practices, which has got us wondering a little bit, why would a bookstore want to be buying our practices? But, PIPs out there in a lot of places. Okay, so why is PIP practices a source of best practices for piping? Well, one is collaboration. I'm going to talk a little bit about how we collaborate. Two, we have member surveys of our members about how they're using practices and which ones they use. Actually, that turns out to be powerful information. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that and the rich in content. And I'm gonna show you some of my favorites when it comes to piping practices in PIP. Okay, the social network, or call it the technical network. Here is, I think, the most radical thing that really PIP brought into play. I touched on it a little bit already. Many of y'all probably had a technical question in the past. You wanted to call up a buddy and ask him the answer to the question. You knew he knew it, but he worked for another company, maybe a company that was a competitor to the company you were working on. When I've had to do that in the past, I always felt a little odd calling them. Not that I didn't call them, and not that he didn't tell me the answer, but I always felt a little odd about it. They're, they're competing with us, and I'm asking them technical questions. The nice thing about PIP is it clearly sets what the boundaries are for non-proprietary, that you can talk to these other members about. Not only can you talk, you are required to discuss these different practices with them and come up with the best solution. So if you've got a question about why'd you put this in paragraph so-and-so on this, you can immediately jump onto the PIP site, send an email, or call them up. All their phone numbers are up there and say, why did you do this? What's the history behind this? Why does it say that? What's the benefit of it? It looks like it's more cost. And you can get the answer right there. So that non-proprietary boundaries is a pretty radical concept when you think about technical knowledge. There's similar demographics. You can see here some of the function teams down at the bottom. The demographics are a bunch of old guys, but you know, probably more to the point. You know, they're engineers and designers. They're in the process. They're in the process industry. They're subject matter experts. When you when you're a member company and you join up and you're going to put somebody on a function team, you don't put one of your kids. You know, you put one of the subject because you're going to go up in there in front of a bunch of owner operators. If you're a contractor, you want your guy to know what he's talking about, right? To bring value. And so, similar demographics definitely helps the collaboration. Uh, there's good, as I mentioned, published levels of communication, and there's a lot of long-term relationships. Hey, a lot of these guys, they've been working together on PIP for 20 years. I've been with PIP with three different companies. So, 
you know, you, you get these long-term relationships, you see people. I've seen people with PIP I've known longer than people that I work with for many years at different places that I've worked. So those long-term relationships help when you're coming up with what the right technical solution is to a question. Here's some secret sauce to why PIP works. One, there's no technical hierarchy. It's not like you got a chief engineer and then a lead and then a designer. Everybody's equal. So everybody's opinion counts. Right? There's no contractual hierarchy. You're the owner operator. You're, you're the contractor. You say, here's a good way to lay this thing out. Owner operator says, now we do it this way. Well, which way are you going to do it? You're going to do it your client's way. But here, everybody's equal. The owner operators can push forward the total cost of ownership equation. The contractors can push forward the, the total install cost equation because that's how we compete. Also, the PIP management's really good. They're pros at this. The management team's been together for 13 years. They're very smooth in setting up everything that we need to make it happen. Surveys. All the member companies are surveyed on what practices they're using. I can look up and I can see which PIP practices Bechtel uses, and they can look up which ones I use. This has helped me a lot when I've had to roll out PIP practices in a company. I'll have my own subject matter experts come to me and say, ours is better. And I can point to this and say, as you see here, I've got a special yellow column here that just shows what percent of this practice has been adopted by our competitors. And when my guy comes to me and says, ours is better, I can point to him and say, but yet our 15 competitors all think this is better. It helps with rollouts, helps with implementation. Okay, probably not something surprising to this crowd, but the most numerous practices are in piping. A lot of them are pipe specs, but there's a lot of design guides, those kind of things in here. Let's take a look at some of my favorites. This is a process unit layout or spacing guide. How you space equipment. When you think about it, I mean, I know you guys know this, but when you, the so spacing equipment criteria probably has one of the biggest impacts of any of the guides on total install cost. And it can also have a big impact just on how efficiently you can design the plant, how many hours you're gonna spend design, just based on your equipment arrangement. So this is a big one. Uh, uh, one of the, uh, uh, you know, oddly enough, for something this important, there isn't really a standards body, an API or ASME, that fully scopes this issue. In fact, a lot of this information, where it came from, is out of the insurance industry over the last 100 years. Because this blew up, and when this blew up, that thing over there blew up, so let's spread them apart a little farther. In fact, if you Google online just equipment spacing criteria, I've done that before, and I've gotten PhD theses on this. In fact, there's a thesis written in Denmark about 10 years ago that compared one of the books I'm going to talk about, the Bosbacher Hunt book, to different other books on spacing criteria showing the differences between how far a heat exchanger is from a pump and what those differences entail. So this is, a, this is such a powerful practice in PIP that the piping team set aside a separate task team to do the review of this and go through it again. They're going to issue, the last, we do that every five years for every practice. This is a 2007 issue. We're going to have a 2012 issue on it this year. So that's one of my favorites. Another favorite one that I've gotten trapped on a number of times is what do you stress analyze on what you don't? It's not unusual for me to get to the end of a job. My stress engineers say, I'm finished. Client says, no, you're not finished. You didn't do what they told us. And down here in subparagraph, the small fine print note, you didn't do this analysis. And as you know, from the design side, and I don't see any of my stress buddies in here, on the design side, stress can really mess you up. They can really cost you a lot of time, go through it. So actually, the less that's being stressed from a design point of view, that suits a lot of design side. So getting something that's standard here that's reasonable, that does a good job of providing a safe plant, but at the same time it's not over the top, is very useful. This practice is discussed a lot at PIP. Here's another one that's one of my favorites, mainly because it's so rich in details. Instrument vent and drain connections. It's got over 130 details in it. You can see here's all the piping, not all of them, but 
there's 160 pip piping classes, but there's the piping class listed there. There's the hydrostatic test uh, vent and drains. There's the valve vent and drains, and behind the pictures, the instrument vent, and, uh, the, the instrument connections, and across the way. Each one's got a separate detail, like you look at that. With PIP, you get the AutoCADs, you get the PDFs, you can revise them. By the way, with PIP, when you get the standards, they're yours. Even if you quit PIP later, you still use them. If your client wants them, you give them to your client. Because you're a PIP member, you can give them to your client. The client can use them. Pipe support. I said pipe support criteria. This is actually the pipe support standards. And I put this up because right now one of the projects that my firm's got uh, is, is that for a owner operator, relatively small, they got nine small plants, uh, they want to redo their corporate standards and they decided to go with PIP. And so we're doing that for them. We're putting all their practices together. What's the first practice they asked for? They had over 600 and they could have picked. The first practice, pipe supports. Probably not surprising to this group, right? You got rich, good pipe supports. Things go smoother in construction. They go smoother in design. It's easier to do 3D modeling. And we've got a good set of support standards. Okay. Now, PIP isn't static either. I showed you those function teams up there. Along the standard lines that you'd see, you know, piping, instruments, mechanical, like that, each function team does their set of practices. But we also look at new things. Everybody in this room, I guess everybody in the world now knows about fracking and what's going on there. And so we recognized about two years ago that, gee, you know, should we be doing something with practices? It's our member companies actually that are doing some midstream work in addition to the other downstream and upstream work they're doing. They're doing some midstream work. They say, hey, you know, we got a weakness here. We need some piping practices and other practices that deal with fracking or particularly pipelines. So we took a look at B31.4, B31.8, and kind of to get the juices flowing and pip and get these practices knocked out, converting our piping B31.3 practices to transportation practices, we brought in Laura Atkins from Heart Energy. Heart Energy is a consultant to the... the uh, Owner-operators, the big boys, that they predict out what the cost of gas and oil is going to be out many years. And she came and gave us a presentation, talked about fracking. You can see the, the map of the United States up there. It's a little fuzzy, but what you can see is in the dark green stuff, that's where wet gas is being fracked. The dark red is where dry gas is being fracked. The light colors of that, the light green, dry gas potential. Wet gas, uh, wet gas potential is the light green, and the light red or the pink is dry gas potential. Now, what's really going on there is that, you know, gas is cheap right now. It wasn't a few years ago. It was for going 15 bucks a million BT, but now it's cheap, two, three, four dollars like that. Uh, but wet, wet gas has really light, sweet, crude in it. You bring the gas up, yeah, the gas is cheap, but you separate out the, the, wet, the wet apart, the light, sweet, crude, and you're making your 90, 100 bucks a barrel worth. So that's why there's a lot of focus right now on the light greens and the dark greens. That's why you got those people up in North Dakota right now, fracking like crazy, that's wet gas up there. You can get oil out of it. She talked about over the next 50 years, I put part of that graph up there, it goes up to 2020 in the right-hand side, forecasted natural pipe, uh, gas production. The red line is where we're at today. You can see how it's exploding. Go down here, there's a South Texas in this bottom left-hand corner. You can see how there's... I don't want to step off the platform here, but there's wet gas. Hey, let me try this thing. Yeah, there's wet gas, dry gas. Turns out the wet gas and the dry gas are related to depth. The deeper you get, the hotter it is, more pressure. The hotter it is, hey, the, vape, the oil dispersed in the gas goes away because it's deeper and hotter. So you'll find wet grass a little closer to the surface, although all fracking isn't very close to the water table. You hear a lot about fracking trying to top of it. Not really. You know, it's deep. 10,000 feet com common. So it's these kind of presentations in PIP that help us focus on what are the practices of the future. And right now we're pushing hard on this and we're pushing hard on biofuels, biotechnology, pharmaceutical type practices too. We've got a lot of members joining there. Not too surprising with the ethanol subsidies, those kind of things. By the way, that motorcycle that Laura's on, Natural gas, converted to natural gas has a range of 500 miles. Got a question? Yeah, uh, 
haven't updated anything recently in the sense of, I mean, we've got cryo supports, things like that. We've got that in there, but we haven't had a big push on the LNG specific. We think we got some specs and things for that. That's for sure. When I was at Technip, you know, they did a lot too, Freeport. Okay, so that's PIP. I got a few more I want to jump. I know I'm running a little long here, but I got a few more I want to hit. Your functional methods. Two points I want to make on your functional. Every company has their own set of functional methods. By that I mean procedures, guides, standards, uh, uh, specs. The four, big four, right? They've all got them. You land in the company, they throw them on your desk, read them on your own time, right? The best way to learn that stuff is to do it the PIP way. Actually, I call it the PIP way. I was doing this back when I was in construction 30 years ago. You sit down with a group of people that are interested and you read it out loud together and you discuss it as you go through it. Sounds tedious, but actually you get a lot of good technical discussion just by reading through it out loud together versus me just sitting at my desk and trying to read it and stay awake at the same time. You know, if I'm reading it out loud with a group, it really works. And that's exactly what we do when we're doing our PIP practices. The function team sits down, one or two people will write it or revise it, but then they put it up on the screen and they read it out loud, what we did, and we debate it. It's a really good learning experience. And the other part about functional methods is it certainly helps if your company's got a strong search feature, if you're on SharePoint, or if you're using Windows 7, the filing, the search on the file systems, much better now. So you can search right inside the documents very quickly. If you've got a good search feature, you can find what you want to find. Frequently the problem is with functional methods is there's 1,500, 2,000 of them, and where is what you want is hard. So you need to have a good search feature. Okay, some of my favorite books. This is my favorite book, Process Plant Layout and Piping Design. Now, I wrote one of the chapters in this book, chapter 16. Taught this in the SPED class for years. So naturally, I'm a little prejudiced. Worked for Ed Vosbacher for a lot of years, sat next to him for five years. So we went out to lunch regularly. So, yeah, but none of those are the reasons why this is my favorite book, maybe a little bit. But the big reason why this is my favorite book, the art is incredible. The guy was an artist. You cannot find these kind of drawings in any other book anywhere. So uh, that's even the nomographs. I did some nomographs for him. Right? He redrew them in his handwriting so that they would look like his stuff, and it looks great in the book. So gave me five $100 bills for that chapter. All I was really looking for was an acknowledgement in the book, but he'd rather pay me cash. That was it. So some more favorite books. I'm sure these are familiar to you guys. Right? There's Ed's, the piping guide, the one I have doesn't look like that anymore. You know, the one I got's all tattered and it's got different covers. And, but you know, it's still up there. The piping handbook, I like the Crocker edition which came out earlier than that. But a lot of my Bechtel buddies did that piping handbook. I think it's a little bit of a hard read but it's very deep in knowledge. So if you wanna get into something deep, usually I go to it when I got some arcane system because it's kind of broken up by piping system types. Stress and strain, it's more of a stress guys type of thing. But the nice thing about it is, it's got simple formulas in it, you can run on a calculator. You don't need some fancy computer program. And you know, if, if you're familiar with the book, there's a few of my favorites in there, formulas that you can use to do some kind of little calculation that's useful. This was an emotional pick, Design of Piping Systems. It's done by M.W. Kellogg. It was written in 1955. That was probably the first really deep like textbook on, I mean, I, I read Rip's stuff Rip Weaver stuff years ago, but the deep textbook technical thing, piping. Pipe. I went up to Amazon. It's up there. I looked at the table of contents. It looks like the same as the 1955 edition. I don't know if they updated it or not, but the table of contents looks like the same. Paperback now. But you want to get into like the, the deep background behind uh, stress analysis and piping layout and really from an engineering point of view, that's a powerful book. This is a fun read. It's written by the Liebermans. They talk about, hey, I got this problem in a pant. My, my, you know, 
we keep going over the high liquid level on this thing. What do we, what do, we do? You know, our, our heat exchanger keeps fouling. It's a nice, easy read. And I think it teaches a lot about equipment. And let's face it, Piper's got to know a lot about equipment. I mean, we're doing all the egress. I don't have to tell you guys. So this is a nice read when it comes to process equipment. See, I thought David was going to be here tonight. So I was going to pitch him something. But actually, uh, David Deal from uh, co or I don't know, maybe they call themselves Zenograph now. I think a freebie, you know, when your stress guys install Caesar, they get a bunch of PDF manuals, three big manuals on their PC. They can give you the PDF manual. In the PDF manual, there's a nice, in the technical one, the technical PDF, there's a little section called uh, technical discussions. It's got some nice stuff on seismic zones, wind, what's cold spring, how does it work. I think it's a, not a big write-up. It's not as heavy stress engineer technical write-up, but it's a nice informative thing to read, and it's free if your company's got Caesar. Okay, LinkedIn groups collaboration. Uh, you know, I know Sped's got an active one. Uh, and I've been talking with the PIP folks about it. In fact, I just put up this group. Oops, I just put up this group. What we're going to try to do is use it for technical collaboration. Now, we have SharePoint sites, and we have, but this is more like uh, what we think we're going to do with it in PIP is try to restrict it so we don't get a bunch of people in there trying to solicit our members uh, for uh, jobs and things. Naturally, our member companies wouldn't like that. Uh, and so uh, we're going to try to restrict it just to the members in there and have technical discussions, but the technical discussions might be, hey, you know, I'm out in my backyard barbecue. I need to buy some fittings. What are the best fittings to buy? So, because we're getting together anyway for, yes, sir. This one? That's me. Well, there you go. I took it right off the site, so that must have been recent. And so, you know, we saw what SPED was doing, and so I'm thinking, well, maybe we can use it for technical. I think the jury's still out, but we're going to give it a try on PIP. Use LinkedIn for that. No doping? I probably shouldn't say that. Probably shouldn't say that. Yeah, we had fun with it. In fact, in fact, you'll see, uh, you know, I can't leave the subject here about uh, best practices for piping without mentioning SPED. I don't have to mention it a lot because you guys know it inside out. But, I mean, obviously, just in the conference, I was just going through the conference. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of powerful, I mean, we're, I'm working on the FPSO right now, right? So, I mean, a lot of good stuff that you got right here. I put some of the old, I mean, you got, Sped Piper Boot Camp and Sped Price Process Plant Layout. Saw it up on YouTube. Very slick. And uh, I put some of the old folks up here that used to teach the class and uh, at the board. Of course, Bill's still right in there, but, uh, you know, Clay for years taught the PDS. And uh, uh, Ross and Vic and Joe. And so, I, you know, good crowd. I wanted to mention, you know, when I think of Sped, I think of Stan Ebner. You know, he's the Dean of Engineering Technology out of the University of Houston. He was right there with us at the very beginning and uh, uh, had a lot to do with, with where SPED is today. So uh, no question, here is a great place for learning piping. That's it.